Come the big night itself, the news crews moved into the biggest, most bombastic spaces available. It was a good night for silly graphics, such as ITV's comedy Xbox Live avatars, shown here depicting the leaders. But no amount of whizzy visuals could disguise the fact that no concrete result was coming at all. It was as though democracy itself was hopelessly constipated. On Sky News, Alistair Campbell knocked heads with political correspondent Adam Bolton. Campbell claimed the coverage of walking gaff magnet Brown had been slightly negative in tone. Get off your high horse for no, two you're, seconds. You started this. I'm you're entitled. The one of accusing the, the television media of being biased <laughs> against you. Adam, you're great at giving it, you can't take it. Oh, fight, fight, fight. Maybe we could have a more sustained dialogue about it, Adam, in the future. Yes, maybe you will. With no clear winner, the news was stuck in an existential limbo, with presenters and reporters left up for days in the political equivalent of a four-day narcotic bender. While Labour and the Tories both tried to woo Clegg behind closed doors, outside everything seemed to be going slightly mad. Sky News experienced two on-air meltdowns. First, Alistair Campbell did his bit to sex up their coverage by winding up Adam Bolton during round two of their ongoing grudge match. Adam, you're obviously upset that David Cameron's not <laughs> I'm not upset. I'm right. Right. I, 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 you I, are. You probably are. Don't keep Alison, asking Alison, 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 no, Alison, no, no, Alison, no, I didn't calm down. I am commenting. Calm don't down. keep saying what, what I think. Alison. This is live on television. No, don't keep telling me what I think. This is what you do. You come on, you say, no one won the election. Fight, 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 fight. Talk to me. I'm fed up with you telling me what I think. I don't care what you're I don't care what you're fed up with. Then Kay Burley interviewed a proportional representation protester in feisty and some might say unshut upable fashion. We're protesting for something, and what, what we're are you protesting, protesting for? for is a change to politics, for fair votes. That's, for... What, they're, that's what they're negotiating at the moment. Well, so that's why what do you we, need to protest? That's what we really hope. They're already doing it. What we you really... might as well go home and watch it on Sky News. Of course, the problem with talking all over protesters is that a bit later the protesters might decide to talk all over you with embarrassing results. People are worried about it. Um, you know, trade-offs, negotiations behind closed doors. Uh, uh, how do you get together and try and organise some sort of polling as far as this is concerned? Finally, after forever, the deal was done. Brown left Downing Street, magically transforming himself into a human as he went, and Clegg and Cameron cosied up and went all broke back mountain in the Rose Garden. It's, uh, it's good, right, having a coalition government because instead of being run by a load of MPs who all agree with each other, it's like Britain's being run by a sort of super group of two totally different musical acts, like if Boney M and Razorlight got together. You know, challenging. It's a bit odd now they're together for, like, the good of humankind and that. It's like when two lonely people who've never found love decide they might as well get together as a couple and force themselves to have sex. But, like, the coalition's laugh, right? They put this little boy in charge of the money. He's called George, and he's, like, 14. He's mental, right? He's basically... He's wheeled out this spending review thing, which is, like, a list of all the things we can't afford anymore, like, you know, schools made of gold or scroungers or basic human dignity. The politics used to be boring and stable, but the coalition, like, kept you guessing. Like Clegg said, he'd scrap tuition fees, but completely... And now he's raising them. So you don't know what he's going to do next, which is brilliant. Because he might, like, nuke Cardiff. Or, I don't know, like, stick a new potato up his ass on Newsnight. You just don't know. It's genius. He's like Freddie Starr or something. You know, mad. Equally exciting to juveniles was the unexpected discovery of 11 Russian spies living in deep cover in the USA. The spy saga had something for every teenage boy, including old-school spying techniques and a foxy lady, gorgeous, pouting Anna Chapman, very much the wanking man's Tori Amos. The coverage treated Chapman as though she was the most beautiful woman on earth, endlessly regurgitating a ready supply of vaguely saucy Facebook snaps on a daily basis. In one plaintive report, Sky News asked a guy who'd known her back in the day what kind of spark there was between them. Anna is a unique woman. She has great interpersonal skills. She's a really good communicator. Yeah, whatever. Could you, could you draw a picture of her tits on this envelope? Of course, I found her attractive. She did attract a lot of attention from men, but she was too immersed in her business to act on it. But by October, that had changed and the story reached its logical conclusion as the redhead under the bed starred in steamy photo shoots and raunchy online videos for Russian ladsky mags. Then the World Cup arrived, bringing with it an opportunity for the world's thickest millionaires to kick a sphere around a lawn. In case you missed the action, it basically looked and sounded like this. <laughs> In July, the world oohed and aahed to the release of Inception, a dream-based blockbuster with ideas above, 
below and beside its station, whatever that means. Drenched with impressive, expensive set pieces and a surreal visual style, Inception's basic plot was complex enough to require its own diagram. It's so complicated, the screenplay was probably printed on a dodecahedron. It followed a man called Cobb, played by Leonard D. Apricot here, as he attempted to plant an idea inside the dreaming mind of another bloke, played by uh, Killian Blue Eyes, at the behest of a third bloke, played by uh, Ken Wannabe. The story involved Cobb and his team carrying out an unreal Russian doll-style heist as they invaded a dream, then induced another dream, and then entered that dream within a dream to kick off another dream, which was a dream within a dream within a dream. It was essentially the motion picture equivalent of a smart-ass little prick dancing around going, oh, look, I'm over here, no, I'm not, hoo -hoo, I'm over here, for 300 hours. It was also a bit like playing three different video game levels at once, including inevitably a boring snow stage, which you immediately want to end the moment it starts. Still, despite being really quite annoying for about 40% of its running time, Inception did include some really interesting ideas, such as uh, dreams are weird, um, and... And it had some great action sequences, including this mind-bending, gravity-defying punch-up, which doubled as a pretty accurate simulation of how it feels to get apocalyptically drunk on a cruise liner. There was also a spooky and spectacular sequence in which Juno Girl makes the French capital fold up like so much concrete origami using the power of her dreaming mind. Well, I haven't seen Paris bend over like that since I downloaded that video. <laughs> I'm so funny. Summer means festivals, and this year there were loads. Glastonbury, the Isle of Wight, Tea in the Park, the Edinburgh Fringe, the Hay on Wye Pretension Fate, and of course the big current affairs street party in Rothbury. You remember that? It started with a guy called Raoul Moat. Yes, when former doorman Raoul Moat, recently released from prison, shot his ex-girlfriend, killed her new boyfriend and then shot a policeman, he immediately became Britain's most wanted man. The only people who wanted him more than the police were the nation's journalists. Before long, police were on Moat's tail and had sealed off the village of Rothbury. Sky News upped sticks and left London behind for a summer holiday on its outskirts. Here, Kay Burley and co hung around the picturesque landscape, watching impressive graphics whoosh from one tranquil, uninteresting scene to another tranquil, uninteresting scene viewed from a slightly different angle. We just see um, a couple of anglers who don't look as though they've caught much, do they? With not even any hot fish action to speak of, they had to content themselves by probing Moat's mental state, reading aloud from his letters like something from a particularly sociopathic edition of Points of View. I'm a killer and a maniac, but I ain't no coward. I'll say you ain't no coward. This whole letter is just devoid of wit. Also of interest was the subject of Moat's physique, which the news speculated could have been the result of steroid abuse, which we were told could turn him into a kind of angry Superman. If you are a hairy male, you'd become more hairier. If you are an impatient male, you would probably become more impatient. If you're an angry male, then you may be a little bit more angrier. Yeah, and if you're a wistful man, you'll get a bit more wistfulier. And if you're good at darts, you'll get a bit more dartsier. It just amplifies whatever makes you a man. Yeah, so it's basically a manplifier. But despite the media's best efforts, the public didn't seem quite scared enough of this manplified bogeyman. Which was a terrible shame because the news seemed to be banking on his box office appeal. Sky News were even using him to promote their new HD service. The net is closing on Britain's most wanted man. Watch continuous coverage on Sky News. Trouble is seeing that you could be forgiven for thinking that if you tuned in you'd see uh, car chases, cops running around, that sort of thing. Whereas instead what you actually got was more like a curious cross between an episode of Wish You Were Here and Crime Watch as Jeremy Thompson took us on a guided tour showcasing Rothbury's genteel charm while simultaneously asking its residents if this was all a bit scary. A bit scary, all this? Yeah. Just a little bit. A little bit? Oh, these two aren't scared at all, unless they're grinning with terror. Quick, find someone else. Well, from the bakers to the local butchers and Morris Adamson open for business today, everything looks uh, back to normal, but I, best, I bet just below the surface things are, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, things are still a little bit tense, you know? A little bit? Well, I suppose he wouldn't be that worried. He's got a rack of knives on the wall. Anyway, so far we've had the butcher, the baker, so here's the candlestick farmer. Mike, it um, must be a bit unnerving to have uh, a gunman at loose around here in the uh, in this remote area. It is a little bit. A little bit. So basically, so far, it's been a little bit scary, a little bit tense and a little bit unnerving. And now here's a little bit of advice for Raoul Moat. How easy is it for a man to hide out here? He would hide as easy as anything. He could last for days out here. Nobody would ever know where he was. Yes, the focus was now moving to Moat's ability to survive in the wild like the UK's most dangerous squirrel. And you could be forgiven for thinking the news was deliberately broadcasting a guide to evading police in the wild specifically for Moat to use. 
Any feral maniacs watching would learn loads. You'd learn what to eat. Eating raw food that's cold will affect his digestion. Hot food? His critical need is not food, it is water. Ah, water. On the informative GMTV, you could learn where to hide. Now, Glenn, as regard to hiding from the police, there can be no better place than that. And there's lots of that around here. So, hide in that, whatever that is. Trees. As well as forests and lots of derelict buildings, we have around here lots of caves. Caves. Deep cave system is actually very warm as well. Deep caves. If it gets cold and it gets wet, it will be warmer in a deeper cave. Wet, warm, deep caves. Oh, I never knew survival could be so sexy. But not as sexy as this hot arsenal action. Yes, it's Call of Duty, Hack Ops, as an anchor provides on-the-run viewers with a handy guide to what weapons the cops tote, presented by a journo palpably trying to stifle his arousal. You can see the sights on there, the ammunition clips that go in uh, to that part of it. Go on, squirt off a few rounds, you know you want to. Fortunately, the desk was there to mask his erection. Drop it! <laughs> <laughs>